So, what does Pinocchio have to do in relationship to his father in order to become real? He rescues him, right? What does he do? He goes down to the bottom of the ocean What does he find there? A whale Weirdly enough, and really weirdly enough, you know, I don't know what a puppet is doing on the bottom of the ocean looking for a whale But apparently it swallowed his father Which also, none of that makes any sense at all You realize it makes no sense, but of course you're in there like Following it and thinking, yeah, well I can, you know I can suspend disbelief You know, it's just a puppet Wooden puppet And it's looking for its father at the bottom of the ocean in a whale That all makes, doesn't make any sense at all, right? It makes no sense whatsoever but it's a mythological motif And part of that motif, it's a death and rebirth motif the Going down to the bottom of the ocean and being devoured by something and then coming back up So that's a death and rebirth motif But even more importantly, the motif there suggests that you can't stop being a puppet A marionette, somebody else is pulling your strings, something else is pulling your strings You're a marionette till you rescue your father from the bottom of the ocean And what does that mean? Well, it means that you're a puppet of forces you do not understand Probably prevailing political attitudes or ideologies or something pathetic like that Until you make the attempt to dive down into the depths and reclaim your identity with history as a phenomena You know, because you might say, well, why should you study history? It's like, well, history is you You know, if you're, if you're not studying history with the understanding that you're studying yourself Then you don't know what the hell you're doing And you can't be a complete person because we're, culture, we're cultural people or cultural creatures You can't be a full person Until you catalyze your identity with your culture And it's, it's like an existential obligation So, and if you don't do it, then you're going to feel all nihilistic and weak Or you're going to be all totalitarian and self-righteous and oppressive And, you know, maybe genocidal and deadly So it's, it's not something that you can just brush off, you have to do it It's part of an initiation motif, by the way, which we're also going to talk about So so, that's some, it's hard to talk about symbolism, and you'll notice, especially in the first part of the lectures, that my lectures are, well, I like to think about them as impressionist And th there's a reason for this, like, I started reading Jung about 30 years ago, I would say, and I pretty much read everything he wrote, which is an awful lot And it's very difficult to read Jung, because the, there's not precisely a linear narrative But the reason for that is that it's very difficult to construct a linear narrative about information that's been primarily transmitted in images And so in order to, to impart the knowledge, you have to give people like sub-pictures of the whole picture It's almost like, like laying them out in space in a sense And so that if you get enough of those little sub-pictures, the whole thing will click into focus And you'll think, aha, I get that But wandering through it in a linear manner is extraordinarily difficult In fact, I don't think it's possible I also think that's why the kind of information that's embodied in symbols is generally not transmitted as linear articulated knowledge You can't transmit it that way And so, it remains in, you know, forms like this Now, you look at those pictures, you know, so think about those pictures for a minute Okay, the picture on the left, so that's ancient Egypt Ancient Egypt lasted for longer than Western, well, if you don't include Egypt as part of Western civilization It certainly lasted longer than what we generally consider Western civilization It lasted for thousands and thousands of years, right? And those images are representations of the fundamental assumptions of Egyptian culture And so those images had foundational power for eons, for thousands and thousands of years you know, and you can just look at them and nothing happens to you You, you, you know, you, you look at them like they're photographs or, or, or flat images But they had the kind of motive power that drove an entire culture for thousands and thousands of years You know, they had more motive power than communist ideology, for example Which only, you know, managed to motivate people for about 50 years And, you know, it's certainly possible that they had more motive power than Christian ideas Which have only been around for Roughly 2,000 years You know, so when you're looking at something like that You're looking at something with power And the idea that, you know, that, that symbolic representations or religious rep representations are What do you call, uh, unsophisticated empirical theories Like, that's an idiotic theory, you know No, I don't think that anybody who's educated should be Should be proposing such a thing after more than a hundred years of Psychoanalytic and anthropological investigation it's just not a tenable theory anymore So, 
So what are the other people up to? Well, let's look, let's look at the left hand side I can tell you a little bit about what the Egyptians were trying to figure out So, on the right hand side of the first picture you have Isis Okay, and now Isis is goddess of the underworld And she's also a goddess of chaos And so she's the goddess of the place that you go when things fall apart around you And it's worthwhile thinking of that as a domain And you know what that's like, so okay so a dream falls apart, or a vision falls apart, or you get dumped by someone you love, or you get betrayed, or you fail Or maybe you just have, you know, maybe you have a, a Maybe you have clinical depression, or you're hyper anxious, or you know, you have some negative emotion pathology Well, that's a state of being, right? You can think about it as a place And that place is the underworld The underworld is where you go when things fall apart And the representation for the Egyptians of the underworld was primarily Isis she was the personified figure that represented the domain that was underneath normative knowledge And the reason she was female, it's very complicated and I, Like I said last time, I really don't have time to explain it in depth, unfortunately But part of the reason that the underworld is given feminine qualities There's, there's lots of reasons, but one of them is, is that The kind of the defining feature of the feminine is that from which new forms emerge that's almost, that's almost like, there's other ways of defining female, but that's our feminine, but that's a pretty good one It's a pretty universal one And the unknown is feminine because the unknown is the place from which all new forms emerge Right, so when you interact with the unknown on a voluntary basis Which can be symbolized sexually, which often happened with Freud's thinking and with his clients You bring forth something new And so it's a terrifying place to descend into It can be hellish, because hell is actually like the worst suburb of the unknown And I'm sure some of you have been there too So, or maybe you're there now Or maybe you know people who are there So it's a very, very rough place to visit, especially if you do it accidentally But, and you, you, if you go there especially accidentally, you might never come out But if you do come out Maybe you've learned something Maybe you're new in some way And that's another reason In some sense why the feminine is a symbolic representation of the unknown because there is a death and rebirth motif there, and birth is always associated with the feminine. So, um, can I remember the word? No, I can't. The baptismal font in in, in Christian ceremonies, so baptism ceremonies, has a Latin word that is basically equivalent to uterus. So you can look that up if you want, I unfortunately I can't exactly remember the word, but it's the same idea, you're being plunged back into The feminine underpinnings of everything and then pulled back up And, well, that's what a baptism is supposed to be You're supposed to be born into the spirit instead of into matter And that means that you've emerged as a, as a um, articulated being that isn't merely a biological product, it's something like that So, alright, so that's, that's ISIS and Isis is the, the wife of, of Osiris, or Osiris, who's in the middle, standing on a pillar there He's the father, and he's a pillar because culture is like the pillars that hold things up And so in the Egyptian story, Osiris was an old king And he was kind of willfully blind, he didn't really know what was going on anymore And he didn't pay sufficient attention, and he had an evil brother, by the way, whose name was Seth And Seth eventually chops him up, wants to take over the kingdom and, Scatters them all over the kingdom, he can't kill him because he's a god And Isis comes up from the underworld and finds Osiris' phallus and makes herself pregnant And she gives birth to Horus, who's the guy on the left And Horus is sort of like King Arthur, or, or any number of orphans He grows up, or, or like uh, that lion in the Lion King Simba, you know how Simba grows up basically outside of the damaged kingdom? Right? And it's taken over by Scar? It's exactly the same story. It's a, it really, it's exactly the same story. And Horus grows up outside the kingdom, and when he grows up, he can really see Horus. That's why his symbol is the eye. He goes back and he can see evil. He's not blind like his father, which is the difference between you guys and dead culture, right? So you're cultural organisms, but you're not dead. You can see and you can update yourself. So you're like the living embodiments of history. And the living embodiments of history have to know what history is and incorporate it into themselves But also be awake enough to alter it where that alteration is necessary Especially when they're doing that to further their knowledge of the unknown and also to triumph over evil 
So, anyways, Horus grows up outside, but like he can see he's different than Osiris, partly because he's young, and he knows that his uncle is evil, and he goes back and has a terrible fight with him. And during the fight, Seth, his uncle, tears out one of his eyes because it's no joke to confront evil. It's no joke. It can damage your consciousness. Anyways, Horus wins, and he gets his eye back, and then he banishes. Seth to the nether regions of the kingdom, because you can't get rid of him either, you can't kill him, he's the potential for corruption in an institution is always there, so there's no permanently getting rid of it, there's only controlling it from time to time anyways, so he gets his eye back, and then instead of putting it back in his head and being king, which you'd expect him to do, he goes back down to the underworld and he finds his father there, because his father, chopped up, is also a spirit who inhabits the underworld, and he gives his father, the eye and then the two of them go back and rule the kingdom together I tell you, it's one of the world's most brilliant stories it's a staggeringly brilliant story because it says, 